Happy Sabbath. I'm Eduardo. And here are the announcements for today. Hope City Records invites you to Soulful Sunday, a musical brunch featuring harmony at the Fruit of the Spirit SDA Church on April 14th from 3 to 5 p.m. They will be presenting a musical tribute to Kirk Franklin with several local gospel artists. For more information about tickets, contact Terza Washington at music at ephesus-sda.com. The Delaware Victory SDA Church Health Outreach is recommending that you attend the Delaware Health and Wellness Expo at the Delaware County Fairgrounds AG Center on Sunday, April 14th from 12 to 7 p.m. There will be free health screenings and giveaways. For more information, go to DelawareExpo.com. Sabbath, April 20, will be Youth Emphasis Day with the theme, No Rush. Come out to hear Dr. Noah Washington bring the word. There will be a dinner following service for all youth and their families. Then at 8.30 p.m., the youth and the young adult ministries are sponsoring a fun night at Dave & Buster's Pilates. Did you know that in Franklin County, there are about 164,950 people without enough food to eat? You can spread the love of God in a radical way by joining the Ephesus Adventist Community Services this year. Our first 2024 Fresh Produce Giveaway will be on April 20th from 12 to 3 p.m. To get involved, email comserve at ephesus-sda.com. The Cincinnati Shiloh SDA Church is sponsoring their second annual Blessing of the Bikes on Sabbath, April 27th. Registration is now open. This year, they've partnered with Kettering Health and the American Heart Association. Get your gear and help save a life. An Adventurer's Honors Fair is scheduled for Sabbath, April 27th, after worship service. This will be a great opportunity for our children to be encouraged and inspired by earning honors that reinforce service, education, and spiritual development. Did your family make less than $70,000 last year? If so, you may be eligible to have your taxes done for free. See your bulletin or go to 614filefree.org for details. If you haven't been able to pick up your 2023 tithe receipt, please send your request to treasury at ephesus-sda.com and state whether you want your receipt emailed or sent in the mail. Don't forget to include your mailing address. Are you or your child graduating in 2024? If so, we want to know. Please complete the graduation information form at ephesus-sda.com forward slash forms by May 11th so you can be recognized this year. For more information, contact Crystal Guys at education at ephesus-sda.com. Every month, the health ministry is adding a healthy recipe to our Facebook page. All of the ingredients can be substituted with vegan or vegetarian alternatives. Try the recipes and then give your feedback at healthmin at ephesus-sda.com. Are you receiving our weekly text messages and our monthly email newsletter, The Messenger? If not, email announce at ephesus-sda.com with your request to be added to the mailing list. The Journal of Pediatrics reports that teen girls who spend a lot of recreational time on the internet are more likely to see their weight creeping slowly up than adolescents who spend less time in front of the computer screen. The association between computer use and weight held true even when the researchers accounted for the amount of exercise the girls were getting. That's a fact. But there's hope. Rather than merely imposing limits on computer time, encourage your teen daughter to engage in additional recreational activities, such as after-school sports and clubs, hobbies, musical instruments, or even volunteering at local charities. If she is spending time in other pursuits, she will likely be using up more calories than just sitting at the computer. So, less time on the computer, plus more time spent on sports or music, 
equals less calories and a better health. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening to the Ephesus Church Family News. Hey Columbus, the moment you've been waiting for is finally here. On Saturday, April 13th at 5 p.m. at the Ephesus SDA Church, prepare to be swept off your feet by the critically acclaimed, historically black Pine Forge Academy Choir. Under the direction of Jarrett Roseboro, this choir continues to wow diverse audiences and win numerous awards, including Philadelphia's WHYY Choir Competition. They've also astounded audiences with their Emmy-nominated film, This Is My Black. Now they're bringing their awe-inspiring talent to our capital city. And the best part? It's completely free. From sacred choral to Negro spirituals, Pine Forge Academy delivers it all with unparalleled excellence. Bring your friends and family and don't miss an unforgettable evening of worship, music, and inspiration with Pine Forge Academy Choir. Live in concert at 3650 Sunbury Road, Columbus, Ohio. Get ready to be blessed by the Pine Forge Academy Choir. church service. I'm so excited today. Are you happy in Jesus this morning? Amen. Let's all stand as we praise him this morning. Say 
lead you in this intro this morning. For the word of God spreads and says, praise ye the Lord. He clapped, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. I'm going to try that one more time. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Now, most of you didn't have what I just named. Most of you don't have a cymbal. And most of you don't have a psaltery. And most of you don't have a heart. But the final scripture says, let everything that hath breath. Are you able to do this this morning? So if you can breathe this morning, you ought to give God some praise. And I don't care how you do it. With a hand clap, with a toe tap, with a hallelujah, with a say amen, with a glory to his name. But the word of God says that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So my words, can you praise the Lord this morning? And Columbus, Ohio, can you praise God this morning? Because he is worthy of all of our praise. Give God a great shout from now. Hallelujah. Father, I hope and pray that you will receive our praise this day. That's why we came. We came to lift you up. We came to magnify your name. As we think about what you've done for us and how you've kept us and how you've protected us. And we've had groups coming from Alabama and from Pennsylvania, but you kept them on the dangerous highways. You, you gave angels that excel in strength the ability to keep them in all of their ways. You have provided for our needs in some great ways and in some small. There's been food on our tables and there's been clothes on our backs you didn't let us pass behind the blue curtains of death last night blood is running warm in our veins we came because we've got breath to give you praise today so god we ask that you will receive our worship not a performance but out of hearts of gratitude for what you've done for us and the greatest thing that you've done for us is that you died on calvary's cross rested on a sabbath but got up early on sunday morning with all power in your hand and you ever live to make intercession for us so god we thank you and we praise you and we pray that our praise might be acceptable to you an audience of one in the name of jesus christ our risen savior and our soon coming king we pray let the church say amen, amen. please remain standing as we lift up our voices in this morning hymn Hymn 559, now thank we all our God. If you could turn in your hymnals to 559, now thank we all our God. Now thank. Now thank we all our God. We
Happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath, everyone. We are excited to be in this place today. Can we put our hands together for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? It is an exciting Sabbath, uh, not just because, let me run through this, uh, not just because we have with us one of uh, the finest choirs this side of the Mississippi. Uh, the white sweaters are here today. Pine Forge Academy Choir is in the building. Y'all make some noise in celebration. Uh, but also, I don't know if you can tell, I have my, my socks on today. I have, I have, I got the blue in <laughs> on today. Uh, the Oakwood University is in the building today. Y'all, come on, alumni of the Oakwood University and give God some praise. Let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. Uh, but not only is Pine Forge here, and my, my best friend, Audie Johnson, here with us today. Uh, not only is, is, is Oakwood University here today, uh, but our president, president of the North American Division, Elder G. Alexander Bryant, is here with us today. It is a wonderful day to celebrate, but it's not a wonderful day to celebrate because of any of those things I just mentioned. However, it is a wonderful day to celebrate because on this Sabbath day, our Lord has provided for each and every one of us a rest. He's provided for us an opportunity to enter into His presence and experience the fullness of the King of the universe. And so we want to welcome you today Myself and our lead pastor, Pastor Keith Goodman, our elders, our team, our staff, we want to welcome you into an opportunity to experience, Mr. Green, the king of the universe made manifest in your presence. So today we want you to celebrate what he's done in your life. We want you to recount that he's kept you from dangers seen and unseen. We want you to expect him to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or even think. We want you to prepare yourself to be comfortable in the presence of God. Amen? Amen? Really quickly, any first time guests with us today, just wave your hand right where you are so we can acknowledge your presence. If you're here for the first time, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Listen, we believe here at Ephesus that this encounter with God is one that will so impact your life that you will have no choice but to leave here differently than you came here. And we're hoping that as you leave, having experienced him, that you would continue to feed on what he's blessed you with today throughout the rest of the week as you grow closer to him and relationship with those who he's called you to. At this point, family, we're going to invite you to stand up. Feel free to move around the sanctuary. Greet someone in the name of the Lord. Let them know you are excited to see them today. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. God bless you. And happy Sabbath.
or greater or stronger than my God. Sing it one more time. Than my God. God loves it when we sing to him, when we sing in faith. I refuse, I refuse to believe that my struggles or my troubles are to this church, humble abode of the mighty, mighty God. You are welcome. And as we go before the Lord in prayer today, this hour, I would like for every one of us, if it is possible with you, to be on our knees. Every every last one of us to be on our knees. We want to seek the face of God. If we are not in unity in any other thing, let that unify us. Let that unify us. That we are all on our knees. mention of the name of the Lord yeah. every knee shall bow it is better for our knees to bow now than when it is too late there comes a time it's going to be late brethren so I want to kneel right now before it is late let us kneel immortal God Ephesible God, the only wise God, Father, at your feet we bow. We thank you for this holy Sabbath. We thank you so much for everything. New every morning is your love towards us. And we are so grateful. We are thankful unto you, our God. Please accept our thanksgiving. Everlasting Father, we have nothing to bring to table, but we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, because you said the Spirit will groan through us, and it will search your heart for that which we need. Father, because your word is true, I pray this, this day that in the mighty name of Jesus, every bended knee, Every bended knee, Father, will receive that which they stand in need of in the name of Jesus. Everlasting Father, we know that you know all that hails us. We know that you know our troubles, our trials, and tribulations. Father, we know that you know more than we do everything in our lives. So, Lord, we humbly ask and we pray, please, Lord, touch us. Create in us a new heart and a new spirit. Please conquer on our behalf. Please, please, please grant us your love for you and for each other. We thank you for answered prayer. Father, I thank you for needs that are met this hour. I thank you for testimonies that will come as a result of this prayer. I thank you, everlasting Father, for unseen evil and dangers that is perverted right now. I give you all the glory for deliverance. Father, I thank you so much for what the heavens is doing right now on our behalf. Be exalted. Be glorified. Be honored. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen.
Anybody feel better after you've talked to God in prayer? I know I do. We can take our burdens to the Lord and leave them there. So whatever you brought this morning in prayer, leave it with Jesus. He can handle it. Amen? We are just excited. People used to say I'm tickled pink. I'm not tickled pink. I don't turn pink when I get tickled. Maybe flush brown. I don't know. But I'm excited to have my alma mater here today. I'm Forge Academy. I'm privileged to have attended that school way back in the Neanderthal ages, 1987 to 1991, four year senior at Pine Forge Academy. And uh, met my lovely bride is also an alumnus of Pine Forge Academy, class of 93. But I just want you to put your hands together and welcome Pine Forge Academy under the direction of Mr. Jared Rosenberg. Good morning to you, Ephesus. We are so happy to be able to be with you on this morning. Uh, we are no stranger, so this is not an introduction, but more of a welcome back uh, in, in being able to worship with you. We're going to sing a couple of songs uh, before the, the pastoral remarks and hope that you are blessed.
good when I went to Pine Coolidge. <laughs> they, this is a next level group of singers. Wow. Put your hands together for them. Well, because they are still standing there, uh, I guess because they, I'm gonna, they're going to come back and do another number, I'm going to move quickly through my pastoral remarks. First thing I want to say, <laughs> Pastor, well, thank you, Pastor Wadi. <laughs> There's only one person who said, take your time. I'm going to be my associate pastor. But <laughs> uh, we're excited that this is a day where we focus on Black Adventist Christian institutions. God has blessed us. He has blessed us with schools. There's a little book that was lost and suddenly found called The Southern Work, and it talks about a special ministry to our own people. And it's all about empowerment, and let the word go forth. It's not about not wanting other people to be educated, but there's a special interest in a people who have been historically oppressed by making sure that we intentionally target our own for excellence. And out of Pine Forge Academy and out of Oakwood University, God has blessed the world with many. I won't even try to name them. But they are before you today, both this morning and then again this afternoon at 3.30. We'll have some from Oakwood University. One of their choirs will be here. And then again at 5 o'clock, We'll have a full concert from Pine Forge Academy. But I want you to know that this is intentional, that you would see them, that you would see their excellence, that you would see their discipline, and that maybe your children or your nieces or your nephews or your grandchildren or some kid in your neighborhood who needs to see that there's more to life than his corner, than his block, that they could be transformed. Our own president, Marvin Brown will talk about how his life was transformed yeah. when he went to Pine Forge Academy. Amen. And now he is the president of the Allegheny West Conference. Amen. So what I'm saying to you is this is intentional. Enjoy it. Soak it up. But it's also intentional because we want our schools to continue. Amen. Oakwood University founded in 1896. Pine Forge Academy in 1946. We want these schools to continue. Amen. We want them to be stronger than they are today. And that's what this day is all about. So at 3.30 today, what time? 3.30. At 3.30 today. So I'm keeping my pastoral remarks short. I'll be out of here in the next three minutes because I want the preacher to preach. Then I need you to go home and get a snack. <laughs> and then I need you to come back at 3.30. I need you to come back at 3.30. What do I need you to do? I need you to come back at 3.30. Now, I wish that we had the capacity at this point to feed everybody and keep you right here on the campus, but we don't. We've got to feed these young people, and then Oakwood is coming over here to eat, and so we won't be able to feed all of you here today. I hope you understand that. It's not personal. It's just a budgetary thing, but tonight I'm going to say to you, so I'm going to give you a chance between leaving here and going home, because you're going to drop your offering in. Amen. 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 So you're not going to give you're not going to give your offering and your tithe tonight. You're going to give that this morning. Amen. 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 But then tonight, I want you to bring back an offering because they didn't come on a bus for free. We had to take care of that. And I don't want you to bring your McDonald's or your Burger King or your Taco Bell offering. I want you to bring. I don't want your roosters offering either. I want your Cheesecake Factory. And your J. Alexander's. Yeah, that's the offering that I need you to bring. And while I do this jokingly, I'm saying it to you to say, you have no problems dropping $100 at your favorite restaurant, do you? You can say, hey man, tell the truth. Because you know, you can't go out like you used to. But we do it. We find the money. And for our institution, we want you to bring it back tonight. We have a few people who are grieving, and we want to keep them in our prayers. Uh, Brother Tony Thomas, Sister Jones, has taken her rest in Christ. Praise God for 93 years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
but her funeral arrangements are still pending. They probably won't be this week, but probably early of the next week. Uh, he was here teaching Sabbath school. Isn't that something? Uh, be, but because he took care of his mother. See, when you do what you're supposed to do in life, he wasn't sitting up in regret. He took care of his mother, and he was able to come here and to minister teaching the Sabbath school lesson. We also hope to keep Elder Ruth Ann Thompson, who's in Saginaw today, burying a family member. And then we also want to remember the Scott family. Our head deacon, Deacon Scott, his last living uncle also passed, and we want to keep the Scott family in our prayers. I don't know if there are others, but uh, let's keep one another in prayer. I've told you about today at 3.30 and again at 5 o'clock. And guess what? At 5 o'clock, you all are going to have somebody open for you. And who's going to open for you is the Columbus Adventist Academy Choir. And they show up can sing. So they're going to they're gonna open up for Pine Forge Academy tonight. It's going to be a tremendous, tremendous, awesome day. Last thing that I want to say on my way to my seat is that God has blessed me in so many ways. He's blessed me with you. This wonderful congregation. He's blessed me with you. He's blessed me with a quarter of a century of ministry. But one of my greatest gifts in life is that he directed me to one Evelyn Fordham Goodman. She is one of the greatest gifts of my life. And it just so happens, just so happens that on a day like today, April the 13th, it would be her birthday. And so, if you stand up and let people see this lovely young lady. Oh, she doesn't have to come up. No, she doesn't. Just, just, amen, amen. Pastor Wadi is so extra. Amen. And uh, she's not the only one who had a birthday today. Sister Belvia has a birthday today. Amen. And has anybody else celebrated a birthday this week? You celebrated one last week? That counts, that counts. Anybody else? When's your birthday? April 10th? Amen. Come on, stand up. If you had a birthday this month in April, stand up. All right? Here we go. Now, let me do my solo, and then you come in when I tell you to come in. All right? Here we go. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, all the April birthdays. Come on, let's sing with me. Happy birthday. is about to come. Before he comes, I'm going to do a very brief introduction. You can see all about him. He's got an earned doctorate of ministry. I'm not going to say his first name because he doesn't use it that often himself. He just says G. Alexander Bryant. But I had the privilege of working with Dr. Bryant early on in ministry. In fact, my brother-in-law and I were just in seminary and we worked in St. Joseph's, Missouri in an evangelistic meeting with Dr. G. Alexander Bryant. And of course, you know, a few years ago, he came back here. So what a wonderful thing for us to have experienced. Impact Columbus. In fact, Impact Columbus is still making an impact. You should know that on Wednesday nights, as a result of what you did, all of the area churches still meet together to celebrate and have prayer meeting together. This month, we're going through a series on prayer. Last month, we were at Central. And so we thank God for Dr. G. Alexander Bryant. He is married to a former Ohioan, a native of Ohio, Desiree Bryant. Amen. And uh, they had three children, three boys. Now they have two. One passed away. But uh, he is a man of God. He is down to earth. 
and I have the privilege of sitting on a committee that he is chairperson of, and I'm sitting there always taking notes because this brother is cool, calm, and collected. No matter what somebody goes to that microphone and says, he just keeps it together. The Spirit of God lives inside Dr. G. Alexander Bryan. Amen. I have no doubt that that same Spirit will speak through him today. After Pine Forge Academy shall have sung, the next voice we'll hear will be the voice of our Lord speaking through his manservant, Dr. G. Alexander Bryan. Hear ye. Emphasis, would y'all mind if we had a little old school church this morning? Is that all right? I promise you, you know this song. Just worship with us. It's a good old song. Simply says this. Mm, lead me. God.
them another amen, everyone. Oh, we can do better than that. Give them another amen, everybody. Thank the Lord for the Pine Forge Academy Choir under the direction of Dr. Roseboro. Thank you. We, we've been blessed today. And I'm almost wanting to say we can just go home. But we've been blessed today. Thank you so much. Uh, we had the Pine Forge Academy Choir at the North American Division Year in Meetings uh, back in October, I think it was October. And they just blessed our souls. And sometimes we get accustomed to this good music. Uh, but we say had some of our other brothers and sisters there. Uh, they had not heard anything like this. They thought they were going to have to wait to get to heaven. And I said, no, we have a little bit of heaven down on earth with Pine Forge Academy. Thank you so much uh, for blessing us and for warming our hearts uh, today. And we just are delighted to be here, to be, have this focus on these schools that God has established. Um, Impact Columbus. I can't think about Columbus without thinking about Impact Columbus. I'm just so happy to be here. I'm so delighted and had such a great experience with all of you uh, last, uh, year before last actually, in 2022. Amen. And my wife told me to be sure to send her greetings. She could not be here today. Uh, we are, my mother actually celebrated her 93rd birthday last Amen. Sabbath. And we have had her in our home for almost eight years. She's totally bedridden, but my wife takes great care of her. And I just uh, miss her, but uh, she wanted to let you know how much she loves you and that she has you in our thoughts and prayers today. Uh, we have Dr. Lewis Jones from Oakwood, and he's gonna share some words for, from, uh, from about Oakwood, and just kind of a peek on what we're gonna talk about this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Bryan. Thank you, Pastor Goodman, Pastor Wadi, and uh, to this great congregation at Columbus, Ohio, Ephesus. I'm so glad to be here this morning. Uh, you know, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and that had its own challenges. I remember when I went to Oakwood, and uh, it was kind of rough because I was Baptist, you know. I, I went to Fellowship Baptist Church with Clay Evans, and, and uh, you know, so I was, I was used to, you know, good music and stuff like that. And I was kind of having a hard time at Oakwood, you know, they didn't, they didn't have, you know, certain kind of meats and, you know, certain kind of things. And I, I was, you know, I was getting a little discouraged. And, and, and I, 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 if I can be trans, can I be transparent with my family? Okay, okay, Tyson, where Tyson went? I saw him, I thought he had my back. I, know, I saw Jamal on the base, that's my nephew, amen. Uh, but, you know, I got a little discouraged, so I decided I was going to leave Oakwood, and so I left, and I went back to Chicago, got me a job in a bank downtown, downtown First National Bank of Chicago, and I was living the dream. Come on down. I decided to go to a party one Friday night. I said it was Friday night. <laughs> I'm waiting on you. I know where I'm going. <laughs> I went to that party, and we was having a good time. And Dr. Bryant, uh, I was had my head down and I was listening to the music and dancing and carrying on, you know. I, I, I said I was, yeah. So <laughs> there I was, and all of a sudden there was a knock on the door. And about 15 guys came in. They were a local gang from that area. We were in a housing tenement project, and I, we were on the 15th floor. And they came in, and they were having a good time. And I came with five of my choir members. <laughs> yeah, they weren't from Pine Forge, but they were five of my choir members. And we were there, and there was about 15 of them, and lots of girls, and lots of music, and lots of food. And we were having a good time. And you're saying, I thought you got up to talk about Oakwood. I'm coming. And there I was, and we were having a good time. And all of a sudden, it happened. A friend of mine stepped on the foot of one of those guys, and they said, let's step outside. 
Now, we were five choir boys, and it was 15 of them, and we said, uh-uh. And so the mother came out of the back. She threw them all out, and it was prayer, prayer peace, and happiness once again. We were, having, we were having a good time. And then Mama said, it was about 12 o'clock, she said, y'all got to go home now. And so she put us out. And I was trying to get a phone number of a young lady. And there I was trying to get her phone number. And while I was trying to get her phone number, my friend said, we gonna go to the car. Come on, Lewis, when you finish, come on down. And they went down. All of a sudden, there was a knock at the door. And my friend came in. He was bloodied from his head to his feet. His head was swollen like a watermelon. And they called 911 because they thought he was dying. It was Friday night. And so the mother said, you got to leave, son, because they're not going to tear up my house. And I started leaving. I was heading for the elevator. She said, don't take the elevator. They'll get you. Take the stairs. And I took the stairs, and I ran down those stairs. And as I was running, I was running, I was running. When I got to the seventh floor, I heard them coming up the steps saying, there he is. It was about 12 of them. And so I turned around, I started running back up the steps. And I heard steps coming down. It was about seven of them. And they said, there he is. Let's get him. And there I was between earth and glory. And I said, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'm going back to Oakwood. I'm going to do what you say. Father, I promise I'm going to Sabbath school. I'm go because to that time, I had never been inside the Seventh-day Adventist church. I had never been inside. And so... The Lord helped me that night. I had to fight, but when you're from Chicago, you learn how to do two things. You learn how to fight and how to run. The wisdom is knowing when to do what. And so I learned that night, and God blessed me and got me off of those steps, and I went to Oakwood. Oakwood is a place where, yeah, you'll learn reading, writing, writing and arithmetic, but it's also a place where you'll learn new math. You'll learn about how he took two fish and five loaves of bread. Oakwood is a place. Oakwood is a place where you'll come down weed smoking, alcohol drinking, sex craved. You'll come down and God will make the profligate pure. He'll make the drunken sober. You'll come down to Oakwood and you'll leave with the Holy Ghost. I remember every Sabbath watching Pastor Wadet. I remember watching him as he was on the praise team, and I am amazed today what God can do. Send your young people to Oakwood, and I promise you, God will make a change. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, we have more to say about Oakwood and Pine Forge and Columbus Adventist Academy. You know, it's no accident that we have those three levels of schools represented. And this was not the Seventh-day Adventist Church's design. It was God's design. These schools don't belong to us. God has given us stewardship of them. But these are God's schools. And as the pastor said, thank the Lord for Pastor Goodman and Pastor Wadi for your leadership here. You've got great leadership at this church. But what he said earlier, we have support from the sacred writings. God says we need these schools for these special people. The regular schools can't do for them what God designed Oakwood to do for its students right. and Pine Forge to do for its students and Columbus Adventist Academy to do for its students. 
These are God's schools. Amen. And what we want to talk about this afternoon, we want to see more of God's young people in the schools that he created for them. Amen. And we're going to talk about that this afternoon a little bit more as we have the rest of the family come. We have people spread all over the city uh, speaking, and we will all come together this afternoon together in praise, but also to talk about how we can make sure that the schools that God has entrusted us with and the students and the young people he's entrusted us, entrusted us with, actually the young people are not ours either. Let me say that again. These young people don't belong to us. God calls these young people his precious Amen. jewels. Amen. And he's given us stewardship of them to help raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit more, how we can do that in a more impactful and a more effective way um, this afternoon. We invite you to come back uh, together. Now it is 1228. And Pastor, I didn't bring a snack. I didn't bring a snack. I didn't bring a snack. I brought a full meal. So let's pray. And let's ask for God's spirit to continue because it, it certainly has been in this place. Father, thank you for the privilege of serving you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us awareness of our need to praise you for what you have done. We praise you, Lord, for, because we have sensed your presence in this place. We praise you to these young people who have sung today to the honor and glory of your name. We praise you, Lord, for the stewardship that you've given us. Now we ask God, during this moment, that you might hide the preacher behind the cross of Calvary, that we may not see him or hear him, but we might see Jesus high and lifted up. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men and women unto me. So draw us, Lord, closer to your throne of grace. This is our prayer in the worthy name of Jesus. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to take them and turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6, and we'll read in your hearing in verse 8, our message is entitled, What Shall We Do? Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass his place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled, I'm in verse 11, uh, by this thing. Yes, please stand with me. Thank you. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrendered the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, master, what shall we do? May the Lord richly bless the reading, the hearing, and the receiving of his word. You may be seated. What shall we do? 
This is a familiar story. And it's a story I would like to glean from to help us in the Christian journey. We do people a disservice when we either tell them or give them an impression that when you become a Christian, all your problems go away. In fact, when you become a Christian, if you didn't have problems, you're going to have problems. And if you had them, they're going to become more intense. And so what I want to talk about just uh, this morning, the time that we have, is how do we as Christians deal with the odds that are stacked against us? I want to give us three points on how we can do that. I want to use this story as a way to illustrate this. This part of the Christian journey requires more of the Christian to move things from what we can see to what we can't see. Okay. You see, we're so used to operating in the natural. And as a Christian, God is trying to get us to operate in the spiritual realm. Are you all with me? Yep. Yeah. And so I want to examine this as we look at it through the life of Elijah and his servant. Elisha and his servant. So get the story. The children of Israel were wandering out in the wilderness and the king of Syria was at war with Israel. And so he would send his scouts, and he could tell from the mountaintop the, the, the path that they were taking. And he would send his scouts and say, okay, Israel is taking this path. At such and such a day, they're going to be at this particular intersection. And he would send his army around another way. So when Israel got to that intersection, the Syrian army was there waiting for them. And the Bible tells us, the passage we've just read, that every time the Syrian army and the king would set up the ambush for Israel, sitting at the intersection waiting, they're looking, they think it can only, the, the most natural way is the easiest way, the shortest way, the, the less difficult way, they're going to go this way. Every time they were set up for Israel, at the last minute, Israel would take a turn. And would it leave the Syrian army sitting on the intersection waiting for him? Wow. Oh, I got a message in there. Come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. Did you know the devil sets you up? And he's waiting for you at the intersection? Did you know you have enemies who set you up on your job? And they're waiting for you at the intersection. Did you know that you had friends in school? so-called friends, who set you up and they're waiting for you at the intersection. And the Bible says every time, it says not once nor twice, in verse 10, every time they did it, God would send a message to the Israelites and say, go a different way. Yeah. Are you all listening to me? Yeah. Now, the way that God told them to go was not always the easy way. Come on, Come on, oh, I wish you all were good for the day. The way God would tell them to go wasn't always the shortest way. Yeah. The way God would tell them to go sometimes didn't even make any sense. Why would you go to Pine Forge when you go to high school, the public school for free? Doesn't make any sense. Right. Why would you go to Oakwood where you got to pay and you go to state school and you can go free? Sometimes the path that God has us take is not always the easy path. It's not always the quick path. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. But I want you to know that God knows that the enemy is camped out at the intersection. Yes. He used to go a different way. And so every time the Bible says it would do it, God would send that message. And I, know, I can imagine leading the Israelites. They said, why are you going this way? We can go to 270 and get right there. The Lord said, no, I want you to go all around the other way. Come on now. Yeah. But 270 is quicker. 
the Lord said, I want you to go the other way. Now, sometimes the Lord doesn't explain to us why he wants us to go the other way. And God doesn't have to explain to us, but we have to know that he's always looking out for our best good. So now the Syrian army and Israel, let's keep reading here. Verse 11, therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, because every time they set up the ambush, the children of Israel went another way. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He said, okay, somebody is telling our secrets. <laughs> Doesn't it seem like somebody's telling a secret? Somebody is tipping Israel off. He said, tell me who's doing it. Now, understand, these were real kings in those days. You know, if you gave up the secret of the king, you'd just take your life like that. Come on, say amen, somebody. And so they became afraid when the king implied that one of you all are telling Israel our military strategy and plan. Tell me who is it. They said, wait a minute, wait, 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 okay. It ain't none of us. We're not telling. Read, read, read what it says. It's a, not in verse 12, not one of, and one of the servants said, none, my Lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you, he said, let me tell you something. We're not telling the secret. Elijah is telling. And they said, some, it's something about Elijah. There's something about your enemies. They know you. Come on, say Amen. And they know about the God you're serving. They said some about them folk going to church on the wrong day of the week on Saturday. When you mess with them, something happens to you. He says something about Elijah. And let me tell you, he said, Elijah got a hookup, and it's not coming from us. But Elijah has such a hookup, he not only knows your military secrets. Read the rest of the verse. He even knows what you are saying in the secret chambers of your bedroom. Thank you, sister. You see, the secret quarters of the king's bedroom, that's when he was most vulnerable. That's when he was sleeping. It was the most protected place in all of his kingdom. He's but Elijah got such the hookup. He even knows when you're whispering to your wife and your concubines and all the other women in there. He even knows what you're saying to them. Yeah. And then the king says in the next verse, verse 13. So he said, go and see where he is. And I like the King James. It says that I may send and, and here in the, it says get him. But the King James said fetch him like he's talking to a dog. You know, you send a, throw a dog a bone and say, go fetch the bone. He said, go and fetch him and tell me where he is. Now, I love this. I love this. Now, Elisha has been the servant of God who's been telling Israel to, no, don't go down there. The king of Syria and his army are waiting for you. Elisha has been tipping them off, and the children of Israel were listening. That's why you got to listen to the prophet of the Lord. Come on, say amen, somebody. <laughs> listen to your pastor. Listen to him. Lord said, no, go a different way. And so they say, so go send him. Find out where he is. Now, I love this. I love this. Elisha knows that the king eventually is going to come after him. So it's important to me the actions of Elisha. The Bible says he's in Dothan. And if you would read the, the scripture and you study the map, Dothan was right in the middle of the valley. And there were mountains surrounding Dothan. And when Elisha set up his tent, he could have set it up near the mountains, in the mountains, so the king couldn't find it. But he sets it up right out in the middle of the valley. It is almost like Elijah saying, if you want me, come get me. I'm not afraid, and I'm not running for your king of Israel, king of Syria. And so look at this, look at this, look at this next verse. 
Look at this next verse. Therefore, in verse 14, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Look at, look at, now, it's just Elisha, one person, and his servant, second person. Look at what the king of Syria sends for these two people. Are oh, y'all listening? Horses with an S, chariots with an S, and then the Bible says that a great army. And then there were two not sure what to do, and then they wouldn't go in the daytime, the Bible said they went at night. Horses and chariots and a great army after two people, and they said, we're going to sneak up on them at night. You know, it's something that tells me something about your enemies. They know when you're hooked up with God, you're no ordinary person. Amen. Are y'all listening Amen. to me? Amen. So the king, if it was just other individual, he sent one or two soldiers. He said, this is no ordinary person. It's something that he has that no one else has. People can look at your life and your connection with God and say, there's something different about this person. They may not know what it is. They may not may be able to describe it. They know this much that you're no ordinary person. And the king knew that Elisha was no ordinary person. So he sends this great army. He sent all these horsemen and all these chariots and all of the, and they go at night. And so Eli Elisha's in Dothan in the middle of the valley. The servant, who from the best research I could find, was about 14 years old or 15 years old. Wasn't older than 15. He was the helpmate for Elisha. And so his job was to prepare the meals and help put the tent up and take the tent down for Elijah. And they were already in the tent. So he was out gathering sticks for the fire. And he was thinking about, what am I going to cook for the servant of the Lord this, this morning? What's going to get his breakfast? What's on the menu? You know, he didn't have any Jimmy Dean sausages. <laughs> this is a servant of the Lord. He has some morning star patties and morning star patties. Are y'all listening to me this morning? Because this is the servant of the Lord. This is the prophet of God. And as he was picking up these sticks, he looks up and he sees the Syrian army in the mountains. That's what the Bible said. They were up in the mountains. And then he looks to his right there in the mountains. He looks to his left there in the mountains. And he looks behind him and there in the mountains. He said, we're surrounded by the Syrian army. And he runs into the tent of Elisha. Yeah. He said, Master, Master, Master. Yeah. The Syrian army has surrounded us. Oh, and Elisha and said, yeah. He was shaving over his Gillette razor. He said, oh, yeah. They out there? Okay, yeah. He said, my master, they're going to kill us. And I love, I love, I love the response. On, I love the response. I love the response. Of, of, of Elisha and he says to him in verse 16 see the, 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 the servant 15 year old kid says what shall we do yeah. Elisha says fear not yeah. you know when, when we're in trouble you know God's first command is not to address the trouble we're in God's first command is always to address us and the storm that's raging in us as Christians, and the journey. God says, I want to deal with the storm in you, and I'll take care of the other stuff, but I want you to fear not. Remember when the disciples were out on the boat? Uh, Jesus, they were out on the boat, and you know Jesus came walking on water, and they thought he was a ghost. The first words to them were, fear not. God's first words to us in our Christian journey, when we're up against things that are, we're outmatched, we're outwitted, we're outgunned, we're outresourced, we're out everything. God says, I'm not going to deal with that stuff. I want to deal with you. Fear not. Look at the Syrian army that's around you. Look at them and fear not. Look them right in the eye. Camp right in the valley and let them know I'm not afraid. Fear not. But 
But you know, in spite of the prophet's best admonition, the young 15-year-old boy needs was still knocking. <laughs> He's they're going to kill us. They're going to kill us today. But then Elisha yeah. added another something for him to contemplate. He said, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Ah, oh, come on, y'all. Let me try this side over here. Let me try y'all. Let me try Pine Forge. He said, fear not, because they that be with us are more than they to be with them. Oh, let me go over here. Let me go over here. Fear not because they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now notice what the prophet is saying. Notice carefully what he is saying. He is not saying we're greater than them. He's not even saying our church is greater than their church. He's not even saying our school is greater than their school. He didn't say we're greater than them. But he said they that be with us are more than they that be with them. In other words, he said you got more on your side than they have on their side. He said take comfort that you got the numbers on your side. Is he right? Well, my Bible tells me in Revelation chapter 12, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angel, and their place of final war in heaven, and a third were cast out with the devil. Now, I, if I can remember my math, my fractions, you all remember those nice things called fractions? Huh? If a third was thrown out, how many were left in? Two-thirds. And from my recollection, I think in the fourth grade, two-thirds is greater than one-third. So was the prophet right when he says, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. So when the devil sends one angel to knock you down, God sends two angels to pick you up. Are you all listening to me? For they that be with us are more than they to be with them. When the devil sends one angel to make you stumble, God sends two angels to keep you from falling. For they that be with us are more than they will be with them. Great, isn't it? But the young man, the prophet still hadn't gotten through to him. The young man's knees were still knocking. He said, they're going to kill us today. That sounds good, fear not. This sounds good, they to be with us. But I I'm looking at all this Syrian army, they about to kill us. What shall we do? Now remember, this 15-year-old boy, he didn't have status like the prophet. He didn't have money, because if he had money, he wouldn't be a servant to the prophet. He didn't have education. In fact, the Bible never, ever even tells us his name. It just calls him a servant. Fifteen years old or young. first point I want to bring today is God guarantees you, when you're in your Christian journey, the assurance of his presence. Even when you can't see it. So the prophet goes on. He said, fear not, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Elijah prayed a prayer in verse 17. And he said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. I understand he's not a prophet, he's not a pastor, he's not an elder in the church, he's not a deacon on the deacon board, he's not even any leader in the church. 
But Elijah prays a prayer and says, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And guess what God did? He opened his eyes so that he could see what Elijah could see. And when he went back out the tent, he saw the Syrian army surrounding them. But he saw something this time he didn't see before. In fact, the Bible describes it here in verse 18. So when the Syrian army, no, in verse 17, then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountains were full of horses and what everybody? Chariots of fire all around Elijah. So God opens the eyes of this young 15-year-old kid that the Bible doesn't even tell of his name so he could see what the prophet could see. And when he went back out this time and he saw the Syrian army, he also saw the army of the Lord. He went back and started waving at the Syrian army. Hey, 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 fellas, how y'all doing? How y'all doing over there? How you doing over there? Because he could see that they to be with us or more than they to be with them. The Lord allowed him to physically see the angels of the Lord that encamps around about him. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's interesting to me, God guarantees you the assurance of his presence. That's what he, he sees, that's what God is trying to do. And he said, wow. The second thing that God does is gives him a glimpse of his power. See, look at what the young man sees. In, in the latter part of verse 17, it says, Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and the, behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around the land. Look what God sends. What did the Syrian army have? Horses and chariots and a great army. What did God send? Horses and chariots. But their because God's horses and chariots were horses and chariots of fire. God said, I got something extra. You know, what God did, he spoke in a language that this young 15-year-old could understand. He understood the power of horsemen and chariots. You know, perhaps if God had sent the angels kind of floating on the clouds and strumming their harps. The young man said, hey, I think the Syrian army can take them fellas. But God was saying, if they got some horsemen, I got some horsemen. If they have chariots, I have chariots. Amen. Now, look in verse 18. It brings me to my final point. Now Elisha said to them, now verse 18, so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people. Now, now when the Syrian came down, read the latter part of verse 17. The Syrian army were, were, was in the mountain. Verse, the latter part of verse 17 tells us what God's army was. What was God's army? Around Elisha. I used to mispreach this because I used to put God's army in the mountains. Come on now. Wow. The Syrian army was in the mountains. Are y'all with me? Where was God's army? Around about Elisha. In other words, God was saying to the Syrian army, if you want to get to him, you got to come through me first. And I've already beat you in heaven. You want another beating. If you want my servant, you got to come through me. Did you know any trap the enemy sets for you? Any challenge that comes in your life. Any difficulty that you're facing for it to get to you. It has to go through God first. Thank you, Lord. We're not 
pawns in the hands of the enemy. We are children in the hands of a loving God. But then the Bible says in verse 18, when the Syrian army came down to him. In other words, the presence of the army of God didn't stop the intrusion of the army of the enemy. Help me somebody. God shows up with all of this firepower Horses of chariot, horses of fire, chariots of fire. The young man felt good. God shows up and the Syrian army comes down anyway. Why does he show up? When I was a kid, uh, Pastor Jones, you were talking about them gangs. I grew up in St. Louis. And there were gangs all over, but the gang that dominated my neighborhood were the Black Demons. And they were correctly named because they were demons and they were black. And they were teenagers, but they dominated our school. And if you did not mess with the black demons, my youngest son, I mean, youngest brother in the first grade got into a first grade squabble with the sister of a black demon. They never passed any licks, but it's a squabble. The, their older brothers found out and said they're going to take my son, they were going to take my little brother and beat him up. Well, my sister found out, and they were going to meet at such and such a place at 3.30 after school. And my sister went there to meet them to take care of her little brother. They started beating on my sister, and somebody ran and got me. Now, I was a year younger than my sister, a lot smaller. You see, I've grown up a lot since then. <laughs> oh, don't you all laugh. Don't you laugh. And when they, somebody came and got me, they said, the black demons are beating up on your sister. I said, well, I said to myself, well, <laughs> I said, let me go and die with her. Because <laughs> I couldn't go home and not get involved in the fight. So then I got another beating coming on from mama. And so when I ran to the fight, the black demons dropped my sister and it got hold of me. And one of them put me in, I think it's a full Nelson. When they pull your arms all the way back, you can't do anything. You're on them. Is that a full Nelson? Yeah. And, and, and in those days, there weren't guns and stuff. There was a few knives, but chains. And um, what do you think? What do you put on that? How do you have Venice know about brass knuckles? Y'all not supposed to know about all that stuff. And I put these knuckles, uh, they put these knuckles on. They had my hand bent back like this. And they had already punched me in the stomach. But with the knuckles, they were coming to my face. And just as he was rearing back, I heard the squealing of some car tires. And it got everyone's attention, so they stopped. And out of the car was my mother's first cousin, who was a security guard. And he came around the back end of the car, and this guy's knuckle hand with these brass knuckles is still pulled back. And he walked up to the crowd. He didn't say a word. All he did was approach the, tri crowd, the, the crowd, unbutted his blazer, and he pulled his blazer back, and he did like this. Now, some of you all don't know why he did it. Hanging on his hip was a 38 police special. When the black demons saw it, 
They said, man, listen, we don't want any trouble. They let me go, and I felt like that lad. Yeah, come on, do something to me. Yeah, 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 come on. God shows up sometimes. And he doesn't always use his power, but he displays his power. So do you really want to mess with him? I know you're giving my child some prob some difficulties financially. He said, but I have a cat on a thousand hills. God just shows up and he pulls his blazer back and he tells the devil, don't you go too far. Sometimes God shows up in your marriages. And he shows up and he just pulls his blazer back and says, I'm the wonderful counselor. You see, God doesn't always use his power. When Daniel was in the lion's den, God didn't kill the lion. He could have. He just gave the lion's life job. When the three Hebrew boys we're in the furnace. God could have put the fire out with his power. He could have spit on the fire. It would have been gone. But he just shows up. He says, I'm going to protect you in the fire. When Jesus, the night of Gethsemane, right before um, they came and captured him. You remember when they came and captured him? And the, uh, the Caiaphas and the high priest and others came with some of the uh, Roman soldiers. And they came and grabbed Jesus' arms. And Jesus said, don't you know that if I wanted to, in fact, the song said he could have called. 10,000 angels. One of my first favorite writers said when Jesus said, don't you know if I want to, I could call 10,000? Said before he finished 10,000. Said the angels in heaven left to come to, he to earth. And some angels uh, it, with power told the other angels, said, no, no, he didn't say come. He said, this is what I could do if I wanted to. I just want you to show what power I have. I didn't say come, but if I wanted to. He could have called. So God gave this young lad. First, first point, God guarantees us the assurance of his presence. The second point, he gives this young man a glimpse of his power. See, because when you know you got somebody got power on your side, you walk a little different. Isn't that right? You walk a little bit more confident. He says, I want you to know who, who's on your side. He says, I, I want you to know what I could do. So God guarantees the shores of his presence. God gives us a glimpse of his power. And the final point, God guides us not by his power, but by his promise. So he could have he could have he could have wiped the Syrian army out. But the Bible says, and in verse 18, they came on to Elijah. Now, it's interesting to me that Elijah could see the army of God. And the servant could see the army of God. But the enemy couldn't see. So God emptied heaven. Are y'all with me? God emptied heaven to show this young man what I could do if I wanted to. So now they come to Elisha. All of this heaven-bound power around him, and the Syrian army doesn't even know it. Elijah knows it. And the servant knows. Right. Now the servant is waiting. <laughs> so Lord, I know you're going to take him out. 
I know you got those horses of uh, a fire over there, chairs of fire. They, they, you're going to take them out today. I know you're going to get them today. Elisha prays another prayer. And the other prayer was, when the Syrian army came down, in verse 18, Elijah prayed, the Lord said, strike this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So he prays the prayer and told the Lord to open the eyes of the servant. He prays another prayer and tells him to close the eyes of the enemy. Oh, come on, y'all. Now, those who are being chased are leading the those who were doing the chasing. So Elijah said, who, okay, look, look at this. I mean, God has a sense of humor. God, Elijah says, uh, who are you looking for? Verse 19. He said, uh, oh, we're looking for Elijah. He said, okay, well, this is not the way. Oh, y'all see how God doing it? Oh, no, this is not the way. Where, where is it? Okay, uh, uh, it's almost like a little kindergarten because they all blind. Come on, say amen, everybody. The whole army, the whole Syrian army, the horses, everybody blind. He said, y'all hold hands and I'll show you the way. The Lord said, I'll make your enemies your footstool. Come on, say amen, somebody. So he said, listen, uh, come over this way, y'all. Watch the rocks. Come on here. Let me show y'all. Come on. Hold hands. And he leads the Syrian army up the one mountain, down the other mountain, through the valleys, to the Israel people that they have been chasing. Elijah prays the third prayer. Lord, open their eyes so they can see. Yeah. <laughs> and when those jokers open their eyes, they say, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> They are surrounded by the people they've been trying to kill all this time. And the king of Israel said to Elisha, so can we kill them now? Just take them out. And Elisha said no. Because God doesn't lead by his power. God leads to his providence. And God says, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth are my ways above yours. That's why we can never figure out what God is doing. And it ain't your business to figure it out. It's our business just to follow. How can Oakwood produce some of the people they produced over the years? They don't have the resources against their competitors. They don't have all the labs and all everything everyone else has. God said, do what I tell you to do. It's not your business to figure out how I'm doing it. How can Pine Forest produce what they produce decade after decade? The only Black Adventist cat Academy on the continent. Because it's blessed by God. And we can't always figure it out or understand what we have to do is follow the way that God has said. So now, Syrian army is in a pickle. They know what they would do if the situation was reversed. They are now surrounded by all the Israelites that they have been chasing. And to the question of the Israelite king, can we kill him? Elisha says no. He said, give them some bread and some water and send them on their way. And if you read the rest of the story, the Bible says, and the Syrians, listen to this, and the Syrians followed them no more. In other words, when they saw that their goose was cooked, what do you think would have happened if they would have killed them? Syrian army, they would have sent some more people. Was, the fight would have continued. But God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. What God assures us of is I will always be with you. I will not always use my power, but I will guide you by my providence. 
because I know what is best. And you want me to use power so you can get to a certain place, so you can get something accomplished, so you can have certain things. He said, but I'm going to use my providence to lead you. And my providence will be best for you than using my power. Are you all with me? My wife and I, We're driving to Denver, or to Denver from Kansas City. It's about 600 miles. And I've been driving for about 350, 400 miles. I got tired. And my wife took the wheel. After she took the wheel, I went back. We had one of these um, conversion vans. And it was a 40 counter line conversion van. And it was, the van was so tall, I could stand up in it. Don't you, don't you even say it. <laughs> but because it was tall, it, it had a tendency to be what's called top-heavy. Yeah. Yeah. So if winds are at high speeds, sometimes it was easier for them to tip over. And so there was a, a bed that you can let out that I was actually sleeping in the back, laying all the way down because I was tired. And... But it was about 30 minutes into her driving, I heard a terrible noise. And as I awakened, I saw fire going up past the window, past my head. And as I sat all the way up and could look through the front windshield, I saw the tire that was on the driver's side in the back beating us down the highway. And it left the van tilted to one side and mo moving back and forth as if it was going to flip over. I knew I did not have time to move from the back of the van all the way to the front to help my wife try to control it, uh, the steering wheel. And um, all I can remember in my, my mind was my wife's little bony elbows. And that van moving back and forth. And I said, Dez doesn't have the strength to hold this van. And I can't get there quick enough to help her. And I said, the devil is trying to take my family out. My three boys were there. They were frantic. Van is moving back and forth. And I'm crying, Dez, baby, hold the van. Hold the steering wheel straight. Don't let it move. Hold it straight. And all Dez could say was, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, I'm the preacher. This time, I wasn't calling on Jesus. I was just saying, hold the van straight, baby. Hold it straight. And Dez was saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I said, Dez, don't hold. Yeah, baby, don't let it flow. Don't let it go. Hold it, hold it, hold it. And Dez was saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Meanwhile, in heaven, angels are looking. 85 miles outside of Denver, they said the Bryants are in trouble. And one angel told the other angel, well, I can go help them. How long does it take you to get there? He said, I, I did my best time the other day. It took me eight seconds. Another angel said, well, I got six wings. I can do it in four seconds. So they'll be dead by the time you get there. And then somebody said, to the father, said, Brian's in trouble. The father said, where is Jesus? The throne was empty where Jesus normally sat because he sits on the right hand of the father, but he wasn't there. He said, where is Jesus? Jesus told the father, don't worry, I'm already there because I've already promised the Brian's. I'll never leave them nor forsake them. All they have to do is trust in me. And Dez was calling on Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And all of a sudden, that big Econolo land van swaying back and forth stopped swaying. It ended up on the shoulder of the highway. And by the way, there was an 18-wheeler that was pressing down on us. And he could not stop fast enough. And he was closing in on us, but the 18-wheeler, the van was set on the side, and the 18-wheeler whooshed on by. 
I went outside and I examined what had happened. And you could see that the, the drum of the van had made a gash in the highway for more than 30 yards. And all of a sudden, the gas stops in the middle of the highway. There is no gash from the middle of the highway to where the van was sitting. Because Jesus said, I'll never, never ever leave you nor forsake you. I'll come to you when you need me. Tow truck driver came. He said, Mr. Bryant, um, how did the van get from, because he looked at the same thing. He went to the highway. He said, yeah. He said, that, you almost been going pretty fast. He's because that, that, that tire drug a long time. But uh, was there another tow truck driver here? Uh, because how did the van get from the middle of the highway, this last gash was, to the shoulder of the road? Did you have another tow truck driver? I said, yes, we did. Yeah. What was the name of the company? <laughs> I said, the name of the company was Jesus. Jesus first, Jesus in the middle, and Jesus last. Because he said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. I want to give you assurance that when you're up against it in the Christian journey, Jesus is always there. Sometimes he will use his power, and sometimes he's going to sit in the fiery furnace with you, but he will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, well, Mr. Bryant, let me just tell you something. This tow truck driver, he said, um, you all are lucky. So why do you say that? He said, there was an Aerostar van with a family of five in it. Four hours ago, three miles from where you are right now, who flipped and the whole family is in a hospital fighting for their lives. I said, sir, with all due respect, luck didn't have anything to do with it. It's the promise of God. And when God says, I'll be with you, he means what he says. When you have financial challenges, God said, I'll be there. God guides us through his providence. He gives us the assurance of his presence. He gives us a glimpse of his power, but he guides our lives through his providence. And so today... Jesus is all you need. What shall we do when you're up against it? Call on Jesus. What can you do when your marriage is falling apart? Call on Jesus. What shall we do when the finances don't totally add up? Call on Jesus. What shall we do when our grades are slipping in school? Call on Jesus. What shall we do when we want to send our children to school and we don't have the money to send them? Call on Jesus. What shall we do? Call on Jesus. You see, Jesus is my rock in a weary land. He's my wheel in the middle of a wheel. He's my shelter in a time of storm. He's my rose of Sharon. He's my royal diadem. He's my wonderful counselor. He's my elder brother. He's my everlasting peace. You see, Jesus is my doctor in the sick room, my lawyer in the courtroom, my teacher in the classroom, my psychiatrist when you all drive me crazy. Jesus is all I need. What shall we do? Call on his name. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. If God was willing to do that for this 15-year-old servant, he empties heaven. Let me show you who you got on your side. But he gives him a lesson 
Because he's waiting for God to use his power. And he watches what God does in blinding the people of his, blinding his enemies, leading his enemies, and then not destroying his enemies. Did y'all get that last one? You see, we like to step on our enemies. God says, no, I'll give them some bread and some water. And let them go their way. And the Syrian army war it no more with Israel. Today, as we close, you want to give me a little, put on the piano, organ, I'm sorry. Today, I would like to just make two appeals. The first appeal is for someone you see, we make, we make following Christ, we make the Christian journey too complicated. It boils down to those three things. Knowing that Jesus is with you, knowing that he has power, but trusting his providence. That's what it all boils down to. And today, if there's someone today who would like to say to Jesus, I want to give you my life, I want to trust my life with you, I want your eternal, continuing presence in my life. I want to have that sense that you're with me. I invite you to just be bold enough to stand wherever you are right now to say to Jesus, I want to give you my life. I want to dedicate my life to you. Just stand right now and say to the Lord, here's my life. Somebody today, man, woman, boy, girl, want to give your life to Jesus. God bless you, my sister. Somebody else today want to say to Jesus, here's my life. I'll give it to you just as it is. That's one thing I love about God. God doesn't care. We, we look at where our lives are messed up and we're not good and all that. God doesn't care about any of that. He just wants, do you want me? Do you want me in your life? Just... Give it to me, and I'll do the rest. You see, want to have assurance of his presence. You want God to give you the glimpse of that power. And see, what the glimpse of the power is, they're just to let you know that the circumstances that you're going through are not greater than God's ability to solve the circumstances. Now, he may not do it in the way you want, but the fact that I know that God can solve it, God can take care of it, he can do it, gives me a peace of mind. And then thirdly, God guides us through his providence. Somebody else today want to say, Lord, here's my life. I give it to you. My second appeal is for those who've given your life to Jesus. But you struggle with those three things. You struggle with having a continual sense of the presence of God, knowing that he is there. You struggle with the fact that sometimes the circumstances of life overpower you. You struggle with the fact that sometimes you don't understand why God is doing it the way he's doing it. You don't trust his leading. But you say today, Pastor, pray for me as I go through this Christian journey so that I will have an assurance of his presence so that I we we'll get a glimpse of God's ability to do anything he chooses to do. And then thirdly, that I will trust God's guidance through his providence. If you want to say to the Lord, you want to say to this pastoral team, you want to say, I want to recommit my life to those three things today. I invite you to stand. I'm going to say a special prayer for you, and we'll close the service today. want to say, I want to, I want to embrace the thought that they to be with me are more than they to be with them. Whatever enemies, whatever challenges, whatever circumstances of life that you're facing. And say, Lord, help me in my daily journey that I might focus on the presence of God in my life 
that I might get a glimpse of his power. And I might trust his providential leading. Even when I don't understand it, I will trust it. Today, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of Elisha and his servant. But that's our story. And continue to bless those today, the young lady who took her stand for you, but those who have also recommitted themselves to a closer walk, to a deeper relationship, a deeper understanding of your presence, a deeper walk, a closer walk with you, O oh God. Keep each of us, Lord, as we battle through the struggles of life that we might keep our eyes on you. This is my prayer in the worthy name of Jesus. And all the people said, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We're about to lift our offering, but let's sing that chorus just once in consecration. Amen. Lead me, guide me. Lead me. Guide me. Along the way. Along. by that word today. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Amen. Amen. Okay, so don't know how I'm going to do this, but God always worked with me in this way. I always ask him, what you want me to tell your people, Lord? I got it through the servant of God today because it wasn't for me to be here to do this and God said I got you like he always does he has us he always has us but we don't trust him enough come on y'all be truthful with yourselves we don't trust him enough so I'm going to be walking around the city of Columbus like this y'all because I know what this means do you know what this means so when I see trouble coming my way, I'll be like, Daddy got it. Okay? Remember that. We serve a God that's great and loving. All he wants us to do is just trust him. Just trust him. I'm going to leave a scripture with you, and then I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward so that we can lift up the offering while I'm reading the scripture. Give generously to him. And do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. Students, everything that you're putting your hand to, God got you. Parents, everything that you're putting your hand to to help your students get there, God got you. For those of us who are single, don't have children, and just live in life, God got you. Don't forget that. The pastor said, remember who you carry on your waist. Remember who you carry in your heart, because he got you. Father God, we come before you right now, and we thank you for the reminder of who you are and whose we are. Lord. We give back to you those things that you have blessed us with. Our finance, our time, our talents, 
and things that we are not even aware of, God, that we have, but you still bring them out of us. So we thank you, God, for those gifts, and we give them back on to you. Now, God, for those who have not, we pray that you will cover them and continue to bless them, but let them give themselves to you, God. Father, we thank you once again for the word that you have blessed us with. In your name I pray. Who is like the Lord? That's right. Who is like the Lord? Nobody. Come on, clap your hands.
the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me in this, saith the Lord of hosts, if I shall not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it, because all things come of thee, O Lord. All things come of thee, O Amen. We have worshiped and we are going to be back here in less than two hours. It's 1.37 and at 3.30, what time? 3.30. 3.30, we'll be back here. You want to get in here early before all the other folk come and take your seat. So make sure that you come on back here about 3.20, maybe 3.15. Let us remain standing and receive the benediction. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise All blessings flow. To him who is able to keep you faultless and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forevermore and the people of God sang together one for the father one for the son One for the Holy Ghost. Oh. Amen. Go in peace. See you at 3.30. Remember, we have food for our Pine Forge Academy and Oakwood's bus is probably driving up right now. Uh, grab a snack. Don't go into a coma. See you at 3.30.